I'm John Batchelor, Mary Kissel, my friend and colleague and co-host of the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, and she is the host of Opinion Journal each day at WSJ.com, 1 p.m. East Coast time. Mary was many years in Asia, seven? Almost. Almost seven years in Asia, at Hong Kong, but traveling around Asia, and has a very good feel for this next discussion, which is very difficult for me to imagine because I've only ever read about it in books. I've been to Taipei, I've never been to Tokyo, never been to mainland, and I've certainly never been to Seoul. This is about three proud warlike cultures, China, Korea, and Japan. And their relationship is poisoned by the last 100, 200, 300, 400 years of warfare in the area, over the seas, over islands, and the warfare looks a whole lot like genocide if you count up the bodies and you look at the war crimes just in the 20th century. So Michael Auslan of the American Enterprise Institute joins us. Michael's writing about what he calls a new Cold War in Asia. It is not a simple one. The U.S. and Russia, two sides, choose one, freedom, tyranny. It is Tokyo, Japan, Beijing, mainland, and Seoul, part of the Korean Peninsula, the fracture to the north, will set aside for the moment. And their contest is not two versus one or one versus two. It's one to one to one. Triggering this most recently is the visit to the Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, the new prime minister, successful prime minister of Japan, Mr. Abe, visited it over these last weeks. And now the internal affairs minister, Yoshitaka Shindo, has visited the same shrine. That will begin to understand the enmity here. Michael, good evening to you. What does the visit to the Yasukuni Shrine mean to Beijing and to Seoul separately? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. Well, it's in many ways the the Yasukuni Shrine is is the uh, the third rail of East Asian international politics. Um, you know, for decades, uh, it, what, what it does is it, it enshrines the, um, the 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 souls and the Japanese religion of those who died in war for Japan since the the late 1800s, um, and it became controversial only in the 1970s when they enshrined the spirits of 14 Class A war criminals, including the wartime. Prime Minister Tojo. Uh, but it really only became toxic when the Japanese Prime Minister uh, at the time, Yasu, uh, Nakasone, went and visited Yasuhiro Nakasone. And then there was a long lull until the very popular Prime Minister Koizumi went. And that's when China and Korea really latched onto it as a way to you know, paint Japan as, as not being uh, regretful or apologetic for the war, as showing that Japan had this dark side that we all had to worry about. And quite frankly, to, and certainly in China, this case to pressure Japan and, and sort of isolated diplomatically in the region, and that that's where we're at today. Because Prime Minister Abe last week, after a year of, of uh, rejecting going to the to the shrine, went, and I think he went because he realizes that relations with China and Korea are not getting any better, and he's going to do what he thinks is in his best interest. Now, Michael, I understand the relationship between Japan and China and why that might not improve. They have different uh, forms of government. One's a one-party state. The other one is a democracy. Um, but, but why the enmity between the continuing enmity between the two democracies, Japan and South Korea? And it, without going into, of course, all of the, 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 the World War II history, they're both democracies now. They both have the same goals. Why the argument? Yeah, you know, from our from our perspective, it's certainly what you would uh, expect uh, that they would recognize their common interests. But I, I think we really uh, just cannot discount how deep historical memory runs. You know, if you're you're standing in the middle of Seoul, and uh, if you're uh, right in the, the the center of Seoul is a gigantic statue of uh, the Korean admiral who defeated the Japanese back in the sixteen in the, the late 1500s, and he's still revered as a as a national hero. Uh, obviously, the his, the history questions remain extremely uh, contentious between the two countries. The the issue of textbooks back in the, um, the the about a decade ago or so, and now coming up again, that whitewash the war and whitewash Japanese atrocities, and of course the comfort women issue. So, from the Korean perspective, the Japanese have never fully atoned; they've never fully apologized. Uh, and from the Japanese perspective, they have done that over and over, and they are not finding a a willing partner, so to speak, in Seoul that will let history be history. 
I watched The City of Life and Death on Netflix over these last days. I'd never seen it. It's the story of the uh, absolute bestiality of the Japanese. The, the, the cruelty, it's beyond belief how they treat the uh, Chinese human beings. I mean, it, it's, and it's a film, I understand, but it's representing facts I've heard about for a long time. This is 1937. This isn't the Second War. This is before when Japan invaded China, took over a big part of China, but then in 1937, the summer of 37, a series of events triggered an attack in Shanghai. Shanghai collapses, and they turn their fury on the city of Nan uh, Nanking, uh, Nanjing. And uh, that film alone is a puzzle to me, because I understand it's an historical document, but it also looks like it's trying to create trouble or stop things from happening. In two th it's made in 2009. I know I'm being suspicious, but I'm coming at this carefully. There's nothing in it that redeems the Japanese. They are demons. And after you finish the movie, you go, yeah, let's nuke them again. I mean, that's the opinion you have. Oh, John. Oh, have you seen the movie? No. It's tough. I don't recommend it. Michael, help me on this. Well, John, you know what it is? Actually, it is part of a cottage industry in China that keeps the memories of the atrocities of the war alive. Uh, and it, it That is, makes sense. You know, and it's in no way to downplay what the Japanese did. And, and to go back just for a, a brief second to Mary's question about, you know, the history, and she said, let, you know, let's not focus on the history. And I certainly agree. Both capitals need to, need to look forward. Uh, but for the Koreans, it's an even more emotional issue because they were colonized for 35 years by the Japanese. Right, and, right. and of course, then the Chinese were invaded. But it is part of a cottage industry. Um, I, I forget the exact percentage on the statistic, but there was a study done a few years ago that looked at the, the number, the percentage of Chinese sort of popular primetime dramas that dealt with the war and precisely what you're talking about, John, you know, Japanese aggression and atrocity. And, and it was an overwhelming number of what was being given to the Chinese people every night on their television screens. But there are museums my, my, you can go to and, and all this. So it, 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 is, it is whipped up to, to remain a live issue in China today. Well, again, China, one-party state, I, they don't have political legitimacy. I understand why they whip up those anti-Japanese sentiments because they want to divert the public's attention from what's going on in China. But what I don't understand, Michael, is why politicians in, in South Korea and Japan, Mr. Abe and Ms. Park, would create tensions to what looks like for their own domestic political ends as well. They can't rise above this? Well, it, you know what? It, it plays well in Peoria. Look, uh, it, it gets support, certainly in Korea, uh, anti-American anti and anti-Japanese politics. You know, President Park is, is a bit of a mystery. Her father, uh, the strong man who uh, was assassinated, he was actually very close with the Japanese. You know, th these are all very subtle realpolitik, you know, politicians. And uh, while he was very close, uh, some people speculate that what she's doing is trying to draw a very clear and thick line between herself and her father. Uh, that may or may not be true. I don't think anyone is ever going to know what her motivations are. What we can do is look at what she's done in her months in office, which has been to embarrass the Japanese at every turn, to humiliate Prime Minister Abe, to use the visits of Vice President Biden and Secretary of Defense Hagel to publicly chastise the Japanese, refuse to meet with them. And I think, uh, again, uh, which is not to exonerate the Japanese, but it is in essence, from a domestic political perspective, to push Abe into a corner. And I think that the, the issue of his going to Yasukuni is not that he's a right-wing nationalist. It's not that he wants to, you know, put Japan back on some path of dominating Asia. I think that he was sending a very clear... He had to... First of all, he knew what the response was going to be in Beijing and Seoul. And I think he was sending a very clear message that for a year he tried, by his own lights, to improve relations. And at the end of that year, he saw that relations were worse. China set up its air defense zone. South Korea humiliated Japan. And I think he said... I'm not going to start 2014 this way. I'm going to do what's in Japan's best interest, as he interprets it, and his best interest. And he is not going to play by their rules. So it's going to be a very bumpy, rocky year ahead. The bitterness that I saw in my, in my experience, it's agitprop, but I saw the bitterness and I could see through it, suggests to me that this is not going to be solved this year or this decade or this century, Michael. This is long standing. So do we get to a point here where they're going to shoot because of history. Are they at that level, or is this posturing? Is this politics? 
Well, I think it's posturing and it's politics, John. I think the problem, though, is that they are maneuvering themselves into a position where either by accident or miscalculation, if they do shoot, it's going to be very hard to tamp it down. I mean, we have seen the level of vitriol and hate in China against Japan with with the riots back in 2005 and, and actually just two years ago when they when they nationalized the islands. Uh, we, we see it in with the Koreans uh, when they have their own territorial disputes and there are people who immolate themselves over these territorial disputes. This, this is at, as I said, it's the third rail and it is at the very core, unfortunately, of the identity of many of these nations, which is that they don't want to give up the sense of victimhood on, on the part of all of them. And they don't want to move forward. And so I think, to your question, it's not that they want to use it to go to war, but that they are maneuvering themselves into a position where it's going to be very hard to back away. And quite frankly, where the nationalist passions that are whipped up may make it easier to to decide to cross that Rubicon, even though, obviously, in their own best interest, no one will really want to do that. And, Michael, the U.S., we can't get South Korea and Japan together. No, I, I think it's a huge, a huge failing on our part. I, I, look, at the end of the day, they have to resolve their relations. But it, to have your two top allies in the most important region in the world not even willing to talk to each other should really be at the very top of your agenda to try and solve. And quite frankly, we need to, at, at some day, and, you know, and Vice President Biden completely failed when he went over just uh, last month. We need to sit them down, you know, whoever it's going to be, top diplomats or whomever, in a room, in a locked room, and really knock heads together, to be quite blunt about it, and say, you guys face extraordinary security challenges from North Korea that's getting worse, from China that's getting worse, and you have got to figure out how to work together. You don't have to like each other, but you got to work together, and you got to work with us, because we're putting our men and women's lives on the line to protect you. And we haven't been willing to do that. And, and instead of this sort of working itself out and getting better, look where we are. At the beginning of 2014, we're talking about how bad it is. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. Michael Allison of the American Enterprise Institute reminding me, Margaret, Margaret, Margaret McMillan, the distinguished professor, the granddaughter of David Lloyd George, has a new book out about 1914. And she has an essay in the Brookings Institution pointing to the conditions that led to the catastrophe in 1914. And one of those conditions was the posturing and the political machinations between Russia and France and Serbia and Germany in the Balkans, triggered by the, uh, by the assassination in Sarajevo. But it was just Michael was talking about it. They don't want to shoot, but they get into a position where when the shooting stops, they can't stop it. Mm. And Margaret McMillan points to the relationship between China and Japan right now as a predicate similar to uh, the Balkans in 1914. Mary Kissel, the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. I'm John Batchelor, back in the 21st century.